So Breakthrough Science Society was basically started in West Bengal in the year 1995 and as a platform to create a new science movement in the country. So this is ba- this was basically the major agenda. Currently it is present in 20 states of India and also actively functioning in foreign countries too. Uh, Breakthrough Science Society consists of scientists, research scholars, IP professionals, professional, lecturers, teachers, students, and many more other people from the similar profession and the background. If I talk about the major aim and objective of Breakthrough Science Society, we basically aim to cultivate and promote scientific outlook and logical faculty of mind so that we can establish a scientific culture in our society. We aim to foster consciousness against unscientific notions, superstitions, fanaticism, and such other many other orthodoxy which prevails in our country pretty well as we all know and would agree about it. Uh, We also aim to fight against the application of science that would cause harm to society and destruction of humanity. We aim primarily to conduct campaign and movement for a secular scientific and democratic education policy. To meet out these aims and objectives, we function through different science clubs, societies, and chapter of BS has been created in different localities and educational institutions. So today, uh, Breakthrough Science Society Delhi chapter is basically organizing a webinar on Higgs boson particle. Uh, We we all would agree on this, uh, that it's one of the most talked about uh, topic in recent time. Just to give you a brief pretext of the same, Britain's Peter, Britain's Peter Hicks and Francois Anglet of Belgium both won the Nobel Prize on October 8, 2013 for predicting the existence of the Higgs boson particle, which explains how elementary matter attained the mass, attained the mass to form universe. Now, even experts say that finding the elusive particle would rank as one of the top scientific achievements of the past 50 years. So this somehow explains us that what is the importance of this topic and how well we all should be aware of. To preside further, I would like to invite Dr. Vinay Kumar, who is the present uh, president of Breakthrough Science Society Delhi chapter, also Associate Professor of Mathematics Department, Zakharasan College, University of Delhi. Over to you, Dr. Vinaykumar. Thanks, Kalpana. At first, on behalf of Breakthrough Science Society, Delhi chapter, I would like to welcome all the listeners in this webinar, whose title is The Higgs Boson Particle, The Building Block of Reality. The main speaker of this webinar is Professor Swamitra Banerjee. He has already joined us. Professor Banerjee is a renowned scientist in nonlinear dynamics and bifurcation theory. At present, he is professor in Department of Physics, Iser, Kolkata. He is also the recipient of Santi Sarup Bhatnagar Award. Apart from this, Professor Banerjee is General Secretary of Breakthrough Science Society, All India Committee. Now, without taking much time, I would like to request Professor Banerjee to start the webinar. This webinar will be in two parts. In first part, there will be lecture of Professor Banerjee, and in second part, there will be question hour session. So I would like to repeat once again that we will take up all questions in second part of the webinar. I would like to request you to mute yourself and switch off the videos. In the meanwhile, you can put your questions in the chat box also. And in second half, we will discuss all the question, hour, question answers. So. <clears throat> Professor Banerjee, you can start. Yeah. Thank you, Vinay and Kalpana. Uh, just let me share the screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, yes, this is visible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me first thank the Delhi chapter of Breakthrough Science Society uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. When I received the request, I had mixed feelings because this is not really my subject. But nevertheless, I understand that it is quite natural for people to have questions about this. So I agreed. And initially, I thought that I would give Why not talk. Agree? But later, I realized that this talk has so much technical material that I'll be quite lost if I want to speak in Hindi because I do not know the appropriate words for them. 
so uh, i will apologize that i will not be able to speak in hindi even though it is it was initially uh, the whole uh, program is initiated by the delhi chapter okay so uh, effectively i understand that the question that most people have in their mind is what is everything made of so the building blocks of reality now this question has been there since millennia and in the early part uh, of human civilization people also tried to answer this question for example democritus epicurus and in our country kanada they wanted to answer this What's question what's the question uh, again you need to mute yourself huh? uh and uh, they came up with the speculative idea that if you keep on breaking th- things then it will ultimately lead to something not further breakable so that that uh, gave rise to the concept of atoms but remember their atom was quite different from the way we conceive atom today their atom was nothing more than uh, dust which can make cannot be any further broken but then uh, when chemistry proper started we realized that there are so many different types of molecules that constitute the things around us and uh, so many different things if if there is so many different things there is no order in it and dalton felt that there must be some kind of underlying reality and then he proposed in a modern term that everything is made of atoms and there are only a handful number of different types of atoms which we know today as elements and whenever they a chemical reaction happens the atoms shake hands with each other they combine and that is why you see that they always combine in whole number ratios and things like so one thing i would like you to just note that the the motivation behind the work of dalton so many different things were there that whenever you see so many different things you conjecture there must be some kind of a underlying reality which is simpler and as we go along you will see that that story line runs through the whole of particle physics and then the things were a bit clarified when mendeleev proposed his periodic table and when he proposed the periodic table he noticed that certain uh, order in the way the, the elements behave and in the way their atomic weights are there but when he composed this periodic table there were gaps and that was a very interesting that provided a very interesting clue to scientists to work on because they knew that there must be a an a, 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 a new element unknown element which would have the atomic weight this much so people started searching for them but search not in darkness but with a very, very clear idea what you are searching this is another story line that will go through in particle physics now when we go when we uh, when at dalton uh, talked about atoms his idea was it is not any further breakable the ultimate constituents of matter but then uh, in the turn of the 19th century uh, we came to realize that that's not quite so there are things structures inside atoms the cathode ray experiments revealed at least one constituent of atom the electrons and then becquerel discovered radioactivity
things a bit clearer. Let us uh, take a very quick look at the Rutherford experiment. What he did was uh, he took a source of alpha particles and the alpha particles would be shot this way, which would fall on a gold plate. Gold is not because he was rich. It is because the gold, gold can be you know, bitten to the thinnest possible uh, sheet. So uh, most of the alpha particles will go through. And he was anticipating that since they will interact with the, uh, with the uh, gold uh, atoms, most of them will go through, but they will be sort of scattered, more or less here. But what he found was that some, small number, but some actually were deflected quite in the opposite direction, as if they are, they are bouncing off something. But looking at the small number of uh, alpha particles that were bouncing the opposite way, he could figure that what they are bouncing against, that is a very tiny part of the nuclei, of the, of the atom. And that was later called the nucleus. So uh, it was understood then that then the positive charge is concentrated in a small uh, nucleus, very small, dense, and the negative charges around it. So the, the image of the nucleus was something like this. The, the, it contained some uh, positively charged particles and some neutral particles. Uh, so this, this was the picture of the, the nucleus that we understood. And then around that went the electrons. But then immediately a question arose. The protons are positively charged. And if they are to be in a very small area, very small volume in the nucleus, they would not be able to stay there because they have repulsive force between themselves. And they would actually, it is the, the nucleus is supposed to explode because of the repulsive force. Both are positively charged. So there must be some other force in that is operative, operative inside nucleus, which binds together the uh, same charged protons and neutrons. And that was called the strong nuclear force. Something that is effective only in the length scale that is of the order of the, the diameter of a nucleus and beyond that it does not have any effect. But then if that is so, then the all the nuclei would be stable because it is bound together by the strong force but then we know that some nuclei are unstable, they break, the radioactive nuclei. So how do they break? So we realize that there must be another force that is responsible for their uh, disintegration, and that was called a weak nuclear force. So uh, we realize that there are actually four types of forces. The electromagnetic force, which we all know about, which is responsible for all the chemical reactions is basically the electromagnetic force. We also have the gravitational force that you know, binds the earth to the sun and does not allow the sun to fly away, uh, earth to fly away. And so we know the gravitational force. And we have the strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and that's all. These are the four types of forces. Now, uh, in the 1930s, we acquired the ability of uh, analyzing the gamma rays, you know, the cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are the ones that come from the outer space. And then as they enter the, the air, uh, they interact with the air. And as a result, they create other particles, the interaction or they hit the air molecules, they create other particles. And therefore, one incoming cosmic uh, ray particle will create a shower of particles. Now, these particles can be detected. And from there, we can infer what was the original one that came. And through that, many different particles were uh, slowly discovered. Uh, in 1928, Paul Dirac was working on uh, quantum mechanics and he obtained an equation 
uh, which are two solutions. You know, there are equations which can have two solutions. A simply quadratic equation can have two solutions. You know that. So his equation also yielded two solutions. And uh, one indicated the well-known electron with a negative charge, but it's opposite. The other, other uh, solution indicated a similar particle with similar character, but with positive charge. And Dirac could, uh, you know, daringly say that there must be this particle uh, existing. And in 1932, this part, this positron, the opposite of electron, everything similar to electron, but with positive charge was discovered in cosmic rays. Uh, so at that stage, when we uh, were uh, analyzing cosmic rays, two more particles were discovered. These were the muon and the tau. And these two have, you know, a characteristic similar to the electron, but with different masses. And since their character is similar to the electron, they are, you know, bunched together along with electron in a class called leptons. Now, uh, while in 1930, while analyzing the beta decay, uh, people found that before the beta decay, whatever was the mass of the particle, after the beta decay, uh, it slightly reduces, very slight, but still there is a difference. And that could not be accounted for in terms of the, the energy that comes out and things like that. And in that situation, there are two, there were two possibilities. One, the law of conservation of mass and energy is not really valid in this case. Or the other, which Pauli uh, conjectured, is that there is some particle which is going out of that event, and which is which is which is so tiny that we are unable to detect it yet. So he proposed that, that there must be another particle. He named it neutrino, which is carrying away the missing energy. And in uh, this took quite some time to to actually confirm. Uh, 26 years, in fact, uh, after which the neutrino was experimentally discovered in 1956. So the, the existence of neutrino was then confirmed. The neutrino is very peculiar particle. You might think that, uh, okay, since we do not every day come across neutrinos, so they must be very rare, but it is actually the opposite. The things that we see around us the electrons, protons, neutrons, the things that we are made of, these are actually rarities. And for every electron in the universe, there are 1 billion neutrinos. So there are a huge number of neutrinos around us. In fact, the sun is emitting a huge uh, uh, torrent of neutrinos towards us, but we don't feel it because they go through the earth as if earth were transparent. If they go through our bodies, we don't we never feel it because they, are, they don't interact with anything in our bodies. But still, they do interact once in a while, and that is how they have been ultimately uh, detected. But what I'm trying to point out is that neutron is another constituent of uh, reality. Now, people started to do some generalization. We have found that electron. Uh, has an uh, antiparticle, positron. And so they argued that then we have other particles, they must also have their antiparticles. So every particle must have antiparticles. Immediately there was a search, the way I said that after Mendeleev created the periodic table, people started searching for the, the gaps, the missing positions. In a similar way, the moment this idea came, People started looking for the antiparticles of the particles that we know, and people found them. And so we now know that every particle has its antiparticle counterpart. Now, we found that whenever an electron is emitted in a beta decay, along with it, an electron uh, neutron is emitted. So uh, since the muon, tau on, uh, these are similar to the electrons, so people conjectured that there must be neutrinos associated with muon 
there must be neutrinos associated with tau one, and people started looking for them and they found. And of course, they're antiparticles also. Now, another there was a development from a, a completely different direction. We know that we do feel force. Whenever there are two magnets, you bring bring two north poles or south poles close to each other, you feel a repulsive force, or north and south, then you feel attractive force, forces are there. Now, uh, how does the force actually act? Or, for example, the sun is attracting the, the earth, how, how is it attracting? Whenever there is an interaction, then what mediates that interaction? Now, in school physics textbooks, you simply uh, hear about magnetic fields, gravitational fields. But uh, quantum theory talks in a bit different terms about fields. It says that whenever there is an interaction, there must be some exchange between them, some exchange of particle, which is mediating that interaction. So if two things are attracting each other, there must be some particle going this way and that. That is how it is. It is something like this, that uh, supposing there are two uh, boats in water and there are two guys standing here and they're throwing balls at each other. This guy throws the ball at this one. This lady catches it and this lady throws the ball at the guy and, and he catches it. So if that happens, you'll find that the two boards will move away from each other as if there is a force acting between them. So the, this is a metaphor. It does not explain everything regarding the action of forces. For example, this will explain only the repulsive force, not the attractive force. But uh, it, it, it gives a mental picture of how quantum theory says uh, there are interaction between bodies. It is always mediated by particles or force carriers. Now we know that whenever we are, there is a interaction between two charged bodies, say two charged particles, positively charged particles feeling a repulsion between each other or a positive and negative particle feeling attraction towards each other, it is always mediated by a particle. In this case, a photon. So photon is a mediator of electromagnetic force. Now photon, if the photon is the mediator of electromagnetic force, and since we know there are four types of forces, there should be something that is mediating the other ones. So people started looking for those. And then we found that this strong force is mediated by particles. They are now called gluons. And the weak force is mediated by not one, but three particles. One, they are called uh, W plus, W minus, and Z. And gravitational field, we do not have a clue yet. We do not have a quantum theory of gravity. And as a result, we do not know which particle mediates gravitational uh, force. Uh, though you might have heard of words like graviton and things like that, but we do not have a clear idea what it is. So I cannot really talk about it. Uh, and then in the 1950s, particle starting from 1940s, I would say, people started making particle accelerators. So whenever there are particle accelerators that accelerate particle and hurl it against something, that means there is a collision of particles, then uh, many things can happen. So suppose there is an incident particle coming this way, there is another incident particle coming that way, they collide. Now, the collision is sort of an interaction out of which many different things can be created. Not only that, because there is a relation E is equal to mc square, energy can be also converted into mass of a particle. So the energy of the two incoming particles, that can be also converted into mass as a result, a result of which there can be a mess of particles resulting from such particle-particle collisions. And that pursuit started in the 1950s and soon it was a complete mess because hundreds of particles, different particles were discovered. And uh, Enrico Fermi 
he told his student leon lederman both were nobel laureates the young man if i could remember the names of these particles i would have been a botanist so so many particles and again notice the the line of reasoning of dalton there are so many different types of molecules there must be some underlying simpler reality so uh, people started looking for some simpler reality uh, behind the plethora of these particles that we were now observing through particle particle collisions and these two people mare gelman and uh, and swick they came up with a very good theory they said that whatever we thought as the elementary particle what were the elementary particle at the time for at dalton's time the elementary particle was the atom uh, then we realized that there are nuclei there are electrons and inside the nuclei there were the protons and the neutrons these were thought to be fundamental particles and when we through the particle particle collisions came up with a huge number of different particles they said no no these are not different particles there is a uh, more fundamental underlying reality these are actually composed of more fundamental particles called quarks so we know we have molecules like the or water molecule h2o if you look at the oxygen uh, atom it has a nucleus comprising the protons and neutrons and uh, electronics whizzing around them but if you look at the proton inside that there are these quarks three quarks up quark two of them and down quark one of them similarly neutron has two down quarks one up quark how does it make sense it makes sense because the up quark has a charge of 2/3 and the down quark has a charge of minus 1/3 so if you put two up quarks and one uh, down quark together together the charge becomes plus 1 and that is the charge of the proton similarly if you put one up quark and two down quarks the charge becomes zero and similarly they showed that all the particles that is that you are that are coming up we in this uh, particle collider experiments these are all basically composed of these quarks for example the pion uh, it is just one uh down quark its antiparticle uh and the up quark so if you put them together their charge will be plus 1 and that's what the charge of the pion is so at at the end of this time we started to create what is known today as the standard model uh we realized that there are uh, not only these two up and down there are six types of different quarks and we have already seen that there are six types of different leptons and these are all fermions with spin of half and whenever there is a force the force is mediated by some particles uh, the mediator of the electromagnetic force is the photon there is only one type of photon but the weak force is is uh, mediated by three types of particles w plus w minus and z and these are three weak bosons similarly there were found eight types of gluons these are the boson particles boson means where the spin is one and experimental uh, work revealed their masses their charges everything so these these were all experimentally verified to be true i'm not going to all these uh, details of what the character of each are let's proceed at this stage a very interesting idea was introduced the idea of symmetry what is symmetry sometimes we see uh, nice flowers and it looks symmetrical right uh, but then if i ask you what is symmetry for example a square is symmetric why what is a symmetry now if there is a square like this supposing on your table there is a square plate and supposing when you are not looking somebody comes and turns it by 90 degrees if you again turn your eyes back to that you will not be able to figure out if it has been turned it is basically the same square so that is why the square is said to be symmetric uh for an operation which is nothing but turning by 90 degrees and in that sense this circle is more symmetric because it is remains the same if you turn it by any angle 
So symmetry is essentially invariance against certain operation. And uh, it was shown in the 1950s, 1954 in fact, Young and Mills showed that bosons have a, a, a specific type of symmetry called gauge symmetry. I'm not going into the details of that. Uh, just just uh, capture the idea. There is a special type of symmetry, gauge symmetry. But there was a problem. Uh, the bosons are the force carrying particles. And if all force carrying particles obey that gauge symmetry, then they must be massless. But the problem was that we already know that uh, photons are massless, gluons are massless, but W boson and Z bosons are not. They have been experimentally found to be massive. And then what is the problem? This is where the important contribution of uh, Peter Hicks and other people, actually it is not by only Peter Hicks. In fact, uh, there are six people who are involved in the Higgs boson uh, proposition. Guralnik, Hagen, Kibble, Higgs, Englert, Drought, all these people. What they conjectured is that uh, either they have to say that the, uh, the symmetry idea was wrong or they have to say that, okay, the symmetry is there and therefore the boson particles are actually massless, but there is additionally a field which interacts with these uh, W plus, W minus, and Z bosons, giving them mass. So it is a new kind of field that is responsible for these particles, even though they obey that, that symmetry, even though that is true, they have mass because of this new kind of field. Now, whenever there is a field, we say that there must be a constant particle with it. So this field was called Higgs field. And the particle that boson particle that mediates that field was called the Higgs boson. And through that, we had, uh, I mean, by the end of 60s, we had more or less a complete picture. Uh, but there was another angle to it. It is that Einstein had, when people realized that there are four types of fundamental forces, uh, Einstein tried to unify them in the sense that he tried to show that these are uh, different facets of the same force. Uh, but he failed. He could not really derive that condition. But uh, in 1968, Abdul Salam, the Pakistani physicist, and Stephen Weinberg, they succeeded in unifying the weak force and the electromagnetic force using the idea of Higgs boson. So, and then the, the predictions of their theory could be tested. And so people had a sort of uh, confidence that probably they are on the right track. And that is what ultimately gave rise to this standard model of particle physics. Uh, in the standard model, it is a, this picture you may have seen in many places. Uh, it, is, it is like a, like a table in which here are the quarks, the up quark, down quark, charm, strange, top, bottom. So all these quarks have been discovered and so we know that they do exist. We talked about the electron, the muon and tau on. Uh, they will have their antiparticles which are, which are not shown and they will have their corresponding neutrinos. So electron neutrino, muon neutrino and tau on neutrino, tau neutrino. And these will also have their antiparticles, electron antineutrino, muon antineutrino, and so on and so forth. These are not shown for the sake of simplicity. So this block is basically uh, one type, the fermions. And here are the force carriers, which are the bosons. Photon, gluon, Z boson, the W boson. And in addition to that, we realize that there's another boson which will come here. So five types of boson particles. And that is all. So when we started, we started with asking the question, what is everything made of? This is what everything is made of. Now, the question is that everything here has been discovered 
experimentally tested and therefore everybody is happy except uh, the thorn stuck in the throat was that Higgs boson. Higgs boson was proposed, as you can see, 19, uh, even before that. Yeah, that was, uh, oh, I didn't write the year, around 1960s, early 1960s. Uh, early 1960s, it has been proposed, but it has not been actually detected. Hmm? The theory for it tells us that it can be seen only when extremely you know, energetic particles collide with each other. And that energy uh, is very difficult to create in particles, so we could not test it for a long time. And then uh, the, the CERN accelerator was built, which is something like this. The Large Hadron Collider was built. Uh, it is a very large uh, ring. And uh, the whole thing is a particle accelerator. That means particles accelerated in two opposite directions and they collide with each other at a point. And where the, the collision happens, enormous number of different particles uh, come out, which cannot be you know, seen and uh, counted by anybody. So automatic uh, detectors are there, which detect them. And immediately that data goes all over the world to, to hundreds of thousands of scientists, they analyze the data and finally all that information is put together to ultimately conclude something. So this is a picture, the aerial picture of this whole thing. It is a 27 kilometer ring, uh, proton beams of seven tera electron folds are created in two opposite directions. And then when they collide, they have a total energy of 14 tera electron volts. And the trillions of proton, protons uh, uh, rotate around this ring and then they collide. And the whole ring, so big a ring, is completely evacuated. The pressure is 10 to the power minus 13. And there are 9,300 magnets that you know, guide these proton beams in, in, uh, in a circular path. Uh, and uh, the data are automatically uh, sensed by 150 million sensors. And naturally, the huge amount of data will be coming to these computers and they will be immediately going to all over the world uh, to different scientists who ever wanted to participate in this work. And finally, their analysis would be put together. And there are four uh, detectors in place. They have special names, a toroidal LHC apparatus called ATLAS. Uh, it's a, it's a, these detectors are big, uh, 7,000 tons, one detector, to detect something that is so very tiny. Uh, then the other is the compact muon solenoid, CMS. Uh, the third one is the ALICE a large ion collider experiment. And the fourth one is the LHCB, Large Hadron Collider Beauty. So these four uh, detectors were there in different places of that ring. And uh, ultimately, they detected. Uh, in fact, CMS did this, the, this particular one detected. The so what do we understand about the nature of reality now? What is everything made of? The things that we see around us, these are made of cells. If you look into the cells, these are made of molecules. If you look into the molecules, these are made of atoms. If you look at into the atoms, these are made of electrons and a nucleus. The nuclei are made of the neutrons and the protons. The the protons and neutrons in turn are made of quarks, the up and down quarks. And uh, that way, we have ultimately come to understand that there are two types of particle, particles, the, the fermions and the bosons. Fermions con uh, uh, comprise these uh, quarks as well as the leptons and the neutrinos. The bosons comprise the, the photon, the gluon, the Z, uh, plus minus uh, boson and uh, the W boson and the Higgs boson. And presently, our 
picture of the building blocks of nature are these. As you can see, that number is very, not very large, a relatively small number. And we are further trying to test whether this understanding that you have obtained is correct or not. But a great relief was that ultimately the Higgs boson was discovered. Through that, we have some confidence that the standard model that we have created is a workable model. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thanks, Professor Banerjee. <clears throat> now uh, we are inviting the question uh, questions regarding this seminar. So I request Kalpana, Kunal, and Ravi to handle uh, to read out the questions one by one, if there is any. And Professor Banerjee will answer. So uh, uh, we have a question session. The first question is, what is beta decay? And the question was uh, of uh, Sahil Kosi. Uh, well, uh, whenever there is a break, break uh, what should I say, disintegration of a heavy nucleus, uh, the alpha, beta, gamma uh, radiation comes out. And in order for an electron to come out, as you can understand, it is a nucleus that is emitting that. And the nucleus itself does not contain an electron. So nucleus does not contain an electron, yet the nucleus is electron is coming out of the nucleus. What is happening? That is a question, and that is what led to the concept of beta decay. So the neutron uh, actually disintegrates, and then uh, so that is how ultimately we do get uh, electrons. Beta decay is essentially that the the process of disintegration of heavy nuclei. Ravi, ask another question. Uh, second question is, does the Higgs boson causing the mass of particle cause a problem for applying Einstein's equivalence principle to the gravitation? And this question is of uh, Samir Kumar. No, we do not know. Because this whole thing has not been, we have not been able to integrate this idea with gravity of Einstein. So this is a still an open problem. We do not know the answer. Next question. How is the presence of quarks determined experimentally? And the question is of uh, Sahil Kosik. Well, uh, that will be a long story because I did not really explain how all these particles were detected. I only explained, I only told that these have been detected, right? Now, basically particle accelerators, hmm, basically particle accelerators are the ones that, uh, I mean, particle accelerators and collision of particles. That is how the existence of these have been uh, ultimately detected. But exactly how, well, that's far, far more complicated than what can be presented in a talk like this. These have been uh, de detected through particle collider experiments. That's all I can say. So, uh, next question. Uh, is Peter Higgs the only theorist who proposed this mechanism as a solution to the mass conundrum? No, 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 no. I, I, I say that there are six people who, uh, in different ways, contributed to development of this theory. Higgs was one of them. Hmm, Higgs was one of them. It is basically... Out of them, somebody's name has to be taken, his, his name was taken. But it is not that he only contributed to this theory, no. Six people did. Any other question? 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन हाउ कैन वी कॉन्फिडेंटली से दैट दीज पार्टिकल आल्सो कैन बी ब्रोकन डाउन इनटू सम मोर पार्टिकल्स ए के मोइत्री वेल अ वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन इन फैक्ट आई डिड नॉट कवर एवरीथिंग आई वाज होपिंग दैट सम क्वेश्चंस विल कम and then that will give me chance of you know discussing something more and this is one aspect the aspect is sometimes you will hear people saying especially the media saying that these are fundamental particles fundamental particles in the sense that they cannot be further broken but you see there are two aspects from which you have to see it for a biologist what are the fundamental fundamental particles molecules while is never interested in atoms because they have nothing to do with atoms for them molecules are the fundamental particles for chemists what are the fundamental particles the atoms because the atoms join in order to form uh, uh, the molecules and they have nothing to do with quark group gluon and things like that they are not interested because their questions are not related to that that way if you see you would find that the what is your building block depends on the question asking and there is nothing like a fundamental the other other aspect is that at the time of dalton the building block which cannot be further subdivided was the atom in the 1920s and 30s the building block became the protons neutrons and electrons everything is made of them and then in 1950s it became the quarks gluons see, as you see as you go on you are seeing more and more structures inside the things which you earlier believed to be unbreakable where do you stop if today you stop and uh, say that no 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 this cannot be further broken this cannot be any 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 further structures inside this uh, 100 years later will be proof fools the way today we think that darwin was uh, dalton was mistaken in assuming that uh, the atom is further un- indivisible therefore it is right to say that in today's frontier of knowledge we have reached up to the stage where uh, uh, these appear to be the building blocks but there is no reason to conclude that these are the ultimate building building blocks the fundamental particles in the sense that they cannot be further subdivided that would be uh, a, a not taking lesson from history so uh, next question next question how are the mediator particle different from matter the question is of uh, sahil kaushik uh, well matter uh there is one thing which you see in physics textbooks as a definition of matter but philosophically the definition is different in physics textbook they say matter and in in radiation as if radiation is not matter but we have seen that radiation is nothing but photon particles or some other particles and uh therefore in that sense these are also matter philosophically matter is anything that that exists independent of our consciousness uh and these are also things that exist independent of our consciousness therefore these are also matter now the ones that are mediating between between uh, the, the the mediators of forces these are therefore also matters because their existence can be tested they have the ability to influence our measuring instruments in that sense they are uh, testable and uh, in that sense these are also matter so what i said as the boson particles the force mediators these are also matter sir can i ask this furthermore yes this Yes. Sir, in physics textbook we learned that matter is everything that occupies mass and space. But in this presentation we learned. Uh, wait, wait. That is, that is that is that is that is a physicist's definition, uh, because then they say that has mass, and yes. you know that gluon does not have mass, 
and yes. photon does not have mass so according to your textbook definition photon is not matter but that's why i said that the physicist definition or the definition given in some textbooks differ from a philosophical definition of matter which one is so, the correct philosophical definition is that anything that exists independent of our consciousness but which has an ability i mean there has to be it should not be imaginary things there has to be some uh, way of testing that they do exist how do you test they should be able to influence some measuring instrument or our senses hmm. that is necessary so if there is anything that exists independent of our consciousness and uh, their existence can be tested then they matter and it does not depend on whether the mass is, mass is zero or not okay so uh, next question is of sachank sinha uh, does the decay of particles uh, is permanent or it uh, particle reconstitute them well uh <laughs> well uh, uh whenever two particles collide then they have their own masses plus the energy and if you if you think of that as an additional mass because of the e is equal to mc square uh, relationship then all that mass put together can give rise to anything that has the same mass or energy put together so mass and energy together is conserved but there are hundreds of different things that can be formed out of this and they can also recombine to form other particles so whenever there are there are you know collisions that can there's an interaction so two things come collide there is interaction and something comes out of it that something can be broken pieces that something can be also combined pieces imagine the simple situation an ion was going around in the air and there was an electron going around in the air they come in the vicinity and the the electron combines with that you get something new right so two things coming together can also form something as a combination of them or they can also disintegrate both are possible uh so the mass and energy together is concept Uh, next question is of uh, niyati why higgs boson attract this much of attention what are the benefits excellent uh, well this much of attention uh, was caused i mean for scientists it was very important because they had created a model that this is what the ultimate building blocks of mat of everything is At, the, at our level of understanding and then then uh, there was something in that model which we do not know whether that is true or not so we needed to confirm that that is actually there without that scientists could not go ahead because suppose uh, many of you may be phd students you commit your career to that standard model and working out further things depending on the standard model and maybe when you turn 50 it is discovered that that model is wrong then what <laughs> you have basically wasted the whole of your life academic life therefore it was very necessary for us to understand whether the model that you have created is true or not and the the missing piece was this higgs boson that is for scientists therefore very important but why did it attract so much uh, public attention that was because of a very peculiar thing because it was called the god particle because in news reports it was called the god particle and so there was a huge hue and cry that uh, you know people have uh, scientists are looking for the god particle scientists are finding god and things like that so all that has been created because of this peculiar naming which is not a scientific naming the story goes like this that 
one Nobel laureate scientist, very important scientist, Leon Lederman, he wrote a book. And uh, it was basically on the Higgs boson particle. And the title of the book was something like that, uh, this particle's name. And then it says that there's a, there's a, you know, one line, the next line is, if the universe is the answer, what is the question? It was a popular book. So the publisher figured that it will have a good sale, but he did not like the name that was given in the first line. So uh, it went between Lederman and the publisher a number of times. And finally, Lederman was, was uh, bored. And he said that, okay, you go ahead and call it anything. Call it goddamn particle. He actually wrote an email saying that, call it the goddamn particle. And then the book came out where the dam was drop dropped. It was just called the god particle. And then the, 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 not that immediately people started reading the book because it did not get very good uh, uh, sales initially. But then the newspapers picked it up, that name, God Particle. And then they started uh, uh, popularizing the name God Particle. So scientists are after something called a God Particle. So, so this is how it becomes such a sensation in the media because of a very bad nomenclature. Scientists never call it, call it the God particle. Scientists always call it the Higgs boson. Any other question? Yes. Uh, Sunil Gupta, uh, which is the biggest problem faced by the standard model? No, as yet, we have some confidence in the standard model. Because uh, using the standard model, how, how do we test a theory? We test a theory that if we create a theory, then using the theory, we make some predictions and we, then we test the predictions. And if the prediction is tested to be true, then it increases our confidence in the theory, but it does not prove the theory to be correct. If the, the test uh, comes out to be wrong, then you simply throw out the theory. So before the discovery of Higgs boson, we were in a situation where we did not know whether we'll have to throw away the whole theory or we'll have to uh, we'll, we'll have some confidence in it so that it can be further improved upon. In order to improve upon, people have to work on it. And they would work if you know that uh, there's a chance of the theory being true. So it is important, therefore, it was important, therefore, to know whether the theory was true or not. In this case, uh, we have confidence that the, the standard model is true, but scientists are always looking for physics beyond the standard model. If you know something, then it, uh, scientists do not get satisfied with that. They want to know more. So people are trying to find out physics beyond the standard model. With the LHC that was there at that time of discovery, you can do that. So they are now building an even more powerful collider. Why? Because they want to go find out if in some situation the standard model will also break down and we need to know something more. Uh, sorry, I want to add on sir, to this question. Yeah. So what about the dark matter, dark energy? Uh, why we are confident it will be there? No, and if no, it is confident that it will be there, no, 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 no. Wait. Okay. And on what basis? Are, are we calculating on the basis of standard model? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, dark matter and dark energy, these things come from astronomy, astrophysics, not from particle physics. What about the neutrinos? They are still not uh, well known about the... Yes. Uh, we know everything about neutrinos. No, I don't say everything, but we know reasonably well about neutrinos. Neutrinos are not dark matter. Uh, dark matter, this issue came because there are situations where we see some star uh, executing some motion around something which you cannot see. So there should be something out there which you cannot see. That is one issue. Uh, and that is why it is, things are called dark, dark matter because dark, we don't see them. But we know from the motion of other things that there must be something there. And dark energy, okay, these are presently you leave it. 
these are these are not related to particle physics. These do not come into the standard model. Presently, you leave it. This comes from entirely different considerations. Sasang Sinha, you can directly ask question. Sasang Sinha. Hello. Are you there? Yes. Sir. Uh, you can ask directly. Please ask questions. Uh, my question was that: Is there any known limitation to the standard model yet? No. We are looking for limitations. Scientists are always trying to find limitations. I request uh, to all of you, if you want to ask question, please uh, ask question directly. <clears throat> Dr. Banerjee. Yes. I'm Niranjan Dev. Uh -huh. uh, may I request you to conduct another uh, long session in the coming days? so that we can understand more about the particle physics. <laughs> because it would, be, it would be better if some particle physicist does it, which I am not. Uh, so no, we can always organize that, yes. I am not that. talking uh, only precisely particle physics, about the physics and the unknown things to us. Okay, we will see, yes. So, uh, Today I have found that, that uh, something new thing uh, I could uh, understand. Something I could not understand many thing. Uh, though I am a, I was a science student, but uh, my access to physics was limited uh, before engineering. So your it was elementary and fundamental research subject. So these are very interesting and illuminating and precisely for uh, establishing the materialist uh, philosophy okay. it's more important uh, it, uh, some other day this boson particle was creating problem got particle this thing that thing though we knew that uh, uh, that is that cannot be an end Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Wendy Sharma. Thank you. Yes. Someone was raising hand. Someone was raising hand. So uh, we have uh, more questions. Uh -huh. uh, one is uh, next. Sunil Gupta's. It's question. Ah, Gupta. uh, already, already answered. Uh, some, it's uh, Samir Kumar Samantha. How is the biggest? Uh, how is the Higgs boson related to the Big Bang? It is not related at all. Uh, that is another problem that was created by the media, the press, because whenever they uh, they talk to scientists, they ask questions that sometimes are not related to the specific thing that is being investigated and uh, whatever the scientists say they you know uh, instead of the important things what they perceive as important that is what they uh, flash in the newspapers that's what has happened in this case as i as i uh, you may have seen in my presentation that the whole thing was trying to answer the question what is everything made of and big bang is not related to that question so, uh, obviously, it is not related to Big Bang at all. The way people try to uh, try to make sense of it is, I mean, in, a, in a roundabout way, is that if the Big Bang did happen, if, it is not yet certain, but if did, that did happen, then, then uh, if you look very close, that means if you look backwards, things will be closer to each other and finally they will be also hot and dense. Hot means hot is a situation where particles are moving at very high speeds. Right? And they are moving at very high speeds and colliding with each other. 
it is similar to the situation that was created inside the large hadron collider there we accelerated particles and made them collide and if the big bang did happen uh, soon after that the situation will be similar so people tried to figure out what could have happened at that time but nothing more than that actually it neither proves nor disproves the big bang theory it is not related to that at all so uh, we are taking two more questions uh, one is in lhc experiment was any new particle found that that was not found before or non apart for apart from higgs boson i i repeat in lhc experiment uh, was yes okay yeah i want to answer the question has any new particle been found uh, yes, no sir. no that is what exactly scientists are now looking for now scientists are conducting the experiment at much higher energies than what was achieved in the lhc experiment the reason is that they are trying to find out if there is something that we did not know that can be found in the experiment they are now trying to do that uh last question is is there is matter then there will be mass how means what i didn't get the question is there is matter uh, question is is there matter then there will be a mass how no there are material particles which have mass uh i mean the electron has certain mass the proton has certain mass the neutron has certain mass so there are particles which have mass that's how we find them there was no question regarding the these particles having mass there was a question regarding the boson particles why do they have mass the boson particles are supposed to obey the the gauge symmetry and if they do they should not have mass but there some of them have been found to have mass so why that was the question hmm. so this answer you can uh, imagine like this that what is mass mass is that if you try to if there is a mass and if you try to push it it immediately does not accelerate it immediately doesn't gain in velocity it sort of resists your attempt to push it right that is the character of inertia there is a character of mass and imagine that uh, you are playing carrom uh, so the, your 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 uh, these things will move the moment you you, uh, you kick it but then if the carrom board has a bit of glue somewhere what will happen it will get stuck there it will get stuck there because of the character of the glue and it gave the the uh, the striker the character that it is unable to move even if you trying you are trying to push it it is similar to the character of the mass so the way the higgs field is sometimes explained is this that its character is like the glue because of the glue you are unable to move it and that is what the mass is but that is for the w plus w minus and z forces but i have one last question so uh, okay okay do the photon particles have zero mass sorry have zero energy sorry there's a dog barking yeah yeah there was a question this have zero mass zero pa- zero energy no photon have energy okay photons surely they have energy yes. but uh, they are also force carriers na so they have they are supposed to have negligible mass and if we according to that put that into einstein's energy mass equivalence e equal to mc square photons do not have rest mass photons do have energy but uh, aren't they supposed to have negligible energy if they have negligible amount of mass e no. equal to mc no 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 their energy is pro- proportional to their frequency okay that is by uh, planck's law okay okay huh? yeah okay shall we finish uh, 
uh there is one more question from vandy sharma i think it would be great if you can answer that as well what are the applications of this discovery gibbs boson in any other field so basically application of this discovery no, in any other field this is uh the our understanding about the material world that is what it has contributed now whenever a fundamental discovery is made fundamental means something that contributes to our knowledge in a fundamental way much later it can be translated into something that is useful when the discovery is made we have no clue when thermodynamics was first discussed we had no clue that we can use it when uh, the transistor was this character was first uh, uh, observed uh, we had no clue that you can use it when the giant magneto resistance was discovered we had no clue that we can use it but now today everybody has a pen drive and a huge amount of data can be stored in it how using that so whenever a discovery is made the application comes much later but if you ask the discoverer what is the use of it <laughs> there is no the answer to this question it, it 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 is something like it is something like somebody asked uh when, when there was electricity first time discovered uh i mean electricity that can be carried in wires flowing electricity somebody asked faraday what is the use of it huh? what is the use of it it's just a play toy but then just just imagine today today everything is based, based on electricity right flowing electricity so do not ask now what is the use of the higgs boson ask 200 years later and people will laugh at you kalpana one uh, question is from just dr anupam was this is not a question uh, he just asked would you please suggest me book regarding particle physics for high school students no uh, high school students should not study particle physics period period no they should understand <laughs> newton's laws archimedes principle bernoulli's theorem yeah things that that are within their reach yes. if you talk to them about particle physics they will only catch words and they will go on talking about those words behaving as if they know many things that don't and this is actually detrimental to their understanding so understanding should go step by step in school they should understand the newton's laws proper they should understand the archimedes principle proper they should understand the uh, valency and how things combine proper these are the things that are at the school level that is what they understand next level they should understand this even college students i should not say that they should try to understand particle physics no they should first understand quantum mechanics properly and then only this comes okay okay uh i think let's uh, we'll be now uh, calling towards the end of the webinar if there is any any one or two question if we can take uh dr somitra would not mind allowing us couple of more minutes then we can quickly take couple of more questions no one or two questions is sufficient now yeah just one or two questions uh there is one question written by uh, mr rabinov if photons have no mass then why is light affected by gravity like in black holes no light is not that way affected by gravity not in the newtonian sense light is affected by gravity because gravity uh, by by einstein's uh, general theory of relativity uh, bends the space around it and the light travels in the shortest path if the the uh, if there's a piece of uh, flat paper you can always take a ruler and draw a straight line on it but if you are asked to draw the straight line on the surface of a globe can you draw that no there the straight line will be like this that is a straight line on the surface of a globe right but it's bent so all that happens 
in presence or in the vicinity of a heavy body is that the the space time bends it has a curvature and light just follows that curvature it's not that it, it's it, it has a mass and it's being pulled by the, the by the mass no no it's not like that it basically travels in the shortest path it that it find, finds the part itself is bent okay uh then i think we are moving towards the end of this webinar i would like to sincerely thank professor somitra banerji for really enlightening us on one of the most important and interesting question i think for the era i would say and this webinar has certainly helped many many of us in clarifying various doubts and left us more curious in fact to know about the universe okay uh also i would like to uh make an appeal here using this platform for all the participants so if anyone wants to join us in the movement against unscientific beliefs superstition and various other orthodoxy please log in to the below mentioned website link which i'm just sharing again and you can get yourself registered as a member this is the link which i have shared in the chat section so everything can be done online basis itself so i think that's all thank you everyone thank you all the part participants thank you dr vinay kumar thank you to professor somitra once again